Hello, welcome back to day two of transformation and oncogenesis. So hopefully the sound quality is back to normal. I have moved back into the original room that I was doing all my filming in since I realized that filming in the kitchen caused a really big echo. So hopefully this sounds a lot better than the last video. So what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up with part five. So part five is all about viruses and cancer. So in parts one through four, we've kind of chunked out information and today we're going to see how all of it comes together. So we're going to start first by both asking and answering a question. So the question that we're going to ask is how can a viral infection transform a cell? And there's three things that we're going to talk about that are characteristics of transformed cells and cells that are transformed by viruses. And the first thing is that cytopathic effects must be reduced or eliminated. So if you think back to um, the last topic that we talked about, so viral infections and thinking about what a cytopathic versus a non-cytopathic virus is, when we think about cytopathic effects, those are when an infected cell dies. And so if we are reducing or eliminating the cytopathic those cytopathic effects, then the infected cell must not die. The second major thing that we have to have is that viral replication must be reduced or eliminated. And so if we have a reduction or elimination of viral replication, this means that when we have transformed cells, they do not produce virions. And the third thing is that the cell must continue to divide. And so in a sense, the cell becomes immortal. So if you're looking at these three things, this idea of an infected cell not dying, these transformed cells not producing virions, and these cells becoming immortal and continuing to divide, and of course as they continue to divide, then that viral genome continues to be copied and divide along with the cell. This hopefully is reminding you of something that we talked about in our previous topic, so topic 16, and that is a persistent infection. So you can think of the idea of transformation of cells being much like a persistent infection. All right, so now that we've got all of the pieces of how a viral infection can transform a cell, let's now start adding in to the second part of this topic. So we've kind of thought about how they can transform a cell, going back to this idea of a persistent infection. Now let's talk about the oncogenesis part. And what we're gonna do is we're first going to talk about retroviruses, and then we'll talk about DNA viruses. So let's start with retroviruses. And for retroviruses, before I give you the answer, I want you all to go ahead and pause the video. And based on the pieces that you've learned so far, both in this topic and also in our previous topic about retroviruses, see if you can come up with a model that retroviruses might cause cancer. All right, so hopefully you've gone ahead and you've done this practice problem. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different answers for this. And probably the one that most students have come up with is this idea of reverse transcription and integration. So if you recall to... If you recall to our previous topic when we talked about reverse transcription and integration, we talked about how this idea of integration can happen pretty much anywhere. So recall that we've got our RNA. This is then reverse transcribed to double-stranded DNA. This happens in the cytoplasm for retroviruses. And then in the nucleus, so let's go ahead and draw a nucleus here. We have our integration complex, and that gets integrated into the host. So we have some sort of a target gene. And then for our viral DNA, we have that long terminal repeat. We have the GAG, Paul and ENV genes, and then the long terminal repeat at the other end. And this gets integrated. So let's go ahead and draw our integrase complex. 
this gets integrated into a target gene. And remember that that target gene is not specific. It can be completely random. So thinking back to day one, when we talked about oncogenes, what if when this virus integrates, this happens to be a proto-oncogene? Or what if it's a tumor suppressor gene? Or what if it's one of the repair, the genome maintenance repair genes? So hopefully, depending on which target you can have, you can imagine that cancer could be caused in different ways. If we have the integration of the virus into a proto-oncogene, so a gene that normally is going to tell the cell to turn on, maybe now that's broken, and that cell cycle continues to always be turning on. So recall from day one that for proto-oncogenes, we have to have mutations where the proto-oncogenes are always on. For tumor repressor genes or tumor suppressor genes, we have to have mutations where those genes are off. And for the genome maintenance genes, we have to have mutations where those genes are also off. So again, accidentally, when retroviruses integrate, they may be able to cause cancer. Kind of going off of this question, we can actually also think about, well, how did we discover oncogenes? So again, I'm going to go ahead and encourage you all to pause the video and to see if you can piece this together as well. So hopefully you've gone ahead and you have done that. And the answer to this directly correlates with the previous practice problem. So when we have the host so let's go ahead and have our host target be a different color. And then let's add in our viral genome here. So I'm just gonna write up our LTRs. Okay, so if we take a look at what the host genome looks like when we have viral integration, this problem should remind you of a problem that we completed a couple weeks back. At this point, it's probably been months, to be honest with you. But when we were talking about reverse transcription and integration, I asked you, how do you think that scientists learned how many retroviruses are in our genomes? And it was a very similar problem to this. And so what scientists did was in many models, so let's go ahead, we're going to try to draw... This is my version of a mouse. It's not great, but it is what it is. So what scientists did was in animal models that had tumors, they went ahead and they did a biopsy of the tumor and they extracted the DNA and then they sequenced the DNA. And so now, of course, the question is, well, what did they look for? Well, we just drew what they looked for. So what they looked for was they of hers were looking for the retroviruses. And we know that retroviruses have very key pieces of their genomes. They have those LTRs, the GAD, the Paul, the envelope. And so if you can find the LTRs, you can find the host target and you can figure out what that gene was. And so when scientists learned how to do this, this of hers became a molecular gold mine for geneticists, for molecular biologists, particularly those interested in oncology. So the majority of our oncogenes that we discovered, that we learned about, were actually through a process very similar to this. Okay, so this is all if a virus inserts into the wrong place. But what about if it doesn't insert into the wrong place? What if it just inserts into a gene that we have no idea what it does and it doesn't seem like a big deal? So if that happens, hopefully you've got an alarm going off and you're thinking about some of those pathways that we talked about. So we know that viruses encode for different proteins and we've talked about how these proteins can actually mess with the cell cycle. So in our topic about the infected cell, we kind of alluded to this and we alluded to this in day one of this topic as well. So many viruses can encode for proteins 
that mess with signaling cascades. So things like p53, that retinoblastoma protein, and you might be wondering, okay, well, where the heck is a p53 RB that is part of the host coming from? It turns out that because of integrating and then um, being copied to get out of the cell, many viruses can actually accidentally end up with a cellular oncogene. So let's talk about a cellular oncogene that was acquired from the host. So again, we're still talking about retroviruses and specifically we're going to talk about RSV again. And the example that we're going to talk about is the SRC gene, which is also known as the SARC gene. So again, this is found in Rouse sarcoma virus. And for this gene, I'm going to write gene slash protein, so the protein product does this. Um, there's kind of two versions of it, if you will. There's the CSRC, which is the cell SARC gene, and then there's the VSRC, or the virus SRC gene. And again, all the C and the V mean is that one comes from the host, one is in the virus, although the viral one did originally come from the host. And so what this SRC or the SARC protein does when it is activated, it is going to promote invasion, it's going to promote cell proliferation, and it's going to turn on survival and turn on angiogenesis. Now, as you're looking at some of the things that this SARC protein turns on, you're probably thinking, wait, that sounds a lot like some of those hallmarks of cancer. So one of the hallmarks of cancer was angiogenesis, continual cell proliferation, invasion dealing with metastasis. So this SARC protein appears to deal with that as well. And so when people looked at the RSV genome. And it turns out when Peyton Rouse did this, he got pretty lucky because not all retroviruses are actually active and they don't retain everything when they integrate, as we learned when we talked about reverse transcription and integration. But he got pretty lucky that the RSV that he worked with had all the pieces. So it had the GAG, the Paul, the ENV, and then it also had this SRC. And this SRC came from the host. So we call this a viral oncogene. So going back to this idea of VSARC or VSRC here. So that's something to keep in mind that this gene, although it is in RSV's genome originally came from the host. And so as you can imagine, when these viruses are integrating and leaving, there are a lot of other viral oncogenes that exist. Another really great example is the RAS protein, and we'll deal with the table here in a second. So RAS is a gene that in majority of cancers actually has a mutation and it's something that we spend a lot of time talking about in cell biology but to put into perspective how RAS works what RAS does is it turns on that retinoblastoma protein so we know that RB HERS is responsible for the cell cycle advancing and so if you have a retrovirus that is carrying these, this oncogene and RAS is now turned on, RAS goes to turn on RB, even if the cell isn't ready or needs to, that cell is going to advance through the cell cycle and it's going to continue replicating. So in the table here on the right, there are actually a lot of different oncogenes that have been discovered. These are not all of them, but these are just a couple of examples from different retroviruses. So again, I don't expect you to have these memorized or anything like that. The reason that I'm showing you these is to just help you see how all of these pieces come together and hopefully 
as we're talking about this, it makes sense as to why we talked about the cell cycle first. And so one thing that I want to leave you with is that these are viral oncogenes, but they originated from the host cell. So even though the virus has it in its genome, they were originally from the host. All right, so this kind of makes sense for retroviruses, right? They can integrate in their, um, when they leave, they steal some genes sometimes accidentally. Again, all of this is accidental. This is not with the purpose or part of their normal reproductive life cycle. But what about DNA viruses? How might DNA viruses cause cancer? And again, I encourage you to go ahead and pause the video and see what you can come up with. All right, so hopefully you've paused the video and you've thought about this idea of how DNA viruses can cause cancer. And one of the ways that they can do so is they can encode for proteins that mess with signaling pathways. And there are, of course, other signaling pathways that we didn't talk about in this class, so ones outside of P53 and RFB, but those are some of the, I would say, more common ones and some of the ones that are more easily um, understandable, if you will. So they're still very complicated, but a little less complex, perhaps, than the other ones. And so DNA viruses are going to encode for proteins that mess with signaling pathways. And I'm going to tell you a couple of common viruses that do this, and that is adenovirus. Um, of course, we talked about polyoma viruses, and so that's going to be SV40 is our example that we've been talking about throughout the semester, and then papilloma viruses. So those that cause warts. So in the rabbits that we saw in day one, the warts, let me know in the comments below if anyone actually looked up um, jackalopes and tell me what you found because that's kind of an interesting backstory. But anywho, I digress. So for these DNA viruses, for polyomaviruses, adenoviruses, and papillomaviruses, even though we see cancer associated with these, these are in terms of causing cancer, these are in terms of association with cancer, very rare. So what I mean by that is maybe one in a hundred thousand infected cells are transformed. So definitely does not happen all the time. And so one of the questions that you might be wondering is, well, how are viral transforming genes discovered in DNA viruses? It makes sense for RNA viruses, right? For those retroviruses, we have key things we can look for in the genome of viruses. So how did we learn about it in DNA viruses? And it turns out we used a bunch of classical genetics methods. And so what we were able to do was to compare and contrast normal and transformed cells and using all of the different omics, so looking at genomics, proteomics, we're able to kind of figure out what is different between cells that are transformed and cells that are not transformed. So something else to keep in mind with these DNA viruses is that viral DNA can be maintained by either being integrated into the genome, so recombination events can happen, or they can persist just as autonomously replicating chromosomes, essentially. Okay, so kind of moving forward, we've said that they can encode, so they, meaning these DNA viruses, can encode for proteins that mess with signaling pathways, but let's get a little bit more specific for how these DNA viruses can actually cause cancer. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a key finding. Anyone remember T antigens? So when we talked about particularly SV40 replication, so that's our model virus for double-stranded DNA that is circular, we mentioned T antigens. So you're probably like, okay, why? Like she said, key finding and T antigen. So clearly this, T, this key finding must have something to do with T antigens. And it does. And what scientists found was that T antigens are found in both tumor cells and transformed cells. 
So cells that have been transformed by viruses that eventually maybe end up as tumors, we found T antigens in those cells. And so what scientists then did as an experiment, because of course that raised the question of, well, is the T antigen enough to cause transformation in tumors? So what scientists did was they purified the T antigen and they put it into cell culture. And you can probably hypothesize what they saw. So what they saw was that the T antigen was enough to cause transformation and to cause tumors. So let's kind of break that down a little bit in terms of the T antigen importance. So the T antigen importance is a purse for replication. So you and I have been first introduced to the T antigen when we talked about replication. But it turns out that the T antigen is also important for activating viral transcription. So the other thing that scientists noticed is that this is one of the only viral genes found when a cell is transformed by a DNA virus. Hopefully I have convinced you that the T antigen is important. So not only is it important for replication and activating viral transcription, it is enough for transformation to occur and for, um, and for tumors to also be caused. And that kind of makes sense because it's the only viral gene that is found when a cell is transformed by a DNA virus. So you can probably guess this already, but let's go ahead and make sure that we're all on the same page. And let's talk about which viruses have T antigens. So we said that adenoviruses can transform. So adenoviruses can have T antigens, and it turns out that they actually have two T antigens. They have one called E1A, and they have another one called E1B. SV40, or the polyoma viruses, they have that large T antigen that we talked about, and that large T antigen is the one that was helping us with replication. So if they are, of her saying that there's a large T antigen, you can probably hypothesize that there's actually also a small T antigen that SV40 has. And we said that papillomaviruses also can cause transformation and are associated with cancer. And papillomaviruses actually have three genes that encode for T antigens. So let's talk about the role that these T antigens have. So how do these T antigens, how are they affecting cell signaling pathways? How are these T antigens when a cell is transformed and we have a T antigen present, how are they able to affect a cell and to cause some of the characteristics that we see in cells with cancer? So let's start with a blank page here. And let's first talk about the RB pathway, and then we'll talk about the P53 pathway. So let's just start with and remind ourselves from day one of what a normal RB pathway looks like. So in a normal RB pathway, here's our RB. Here is a transcription factor. Typically what we have is RB holds transcription factors, which means that transcription is off. And when we need a cell to grow, so maybe we have signals from the environment, so we have cell growth, RB is then phosphorylated. And because that RB is phosphorylated, it then releases the transcription factor and that transcription factor can then go ahead and bind, and transcription is now on, and then that cell can go through the cell cycle, mitosis, so on and so forth. So if we think back to DNA viruses, 
One of the issues as a DNA virus is your host. Your host is only replicating DNA during that S part of the cell cycle. During other parts of the cell cycle, we're not replicating DNA because we don't need to. And so as a DNA virus, what we need is the host cell to be an S phase because they also need their DNA to be replicated. So if they also need their DNA to be replicated and they need the host cell to be an S phase, and part of the way that we get to S phase is through this RB pathway, you can hypothesize that these viruses are somehow going to affect the RB pathway. And that leads us to this question of how do viruses turn on RB, right? So our goal is to get a phosphorylated RB or to somehow knock off that transcription factor so that we can go ahead and advance the cell cycle. So how does a virus do this? Well, there are a couple different ways. You can imagine that there could be proteins that could encode for the phosphorylation, but we just said that the T antigen is enough for DNA viruses to transform a cell. So it's got to have something to do with that T antigen. You could probably hypothesize that there's lots of different ways that maybe the T antigen could do this. Maybe the T antigen somehow phosphorylates the RB. Maybe it disrupts how the transcription factor is binding with the RB. You could come up with many hypotheses as scientists did. And what we actually found was that the T antigen can bind RB. So let's go ahead and Let's draw a little box here to illustrate that we're talking about how the virus does this. So here is our RB. Here's our transcription factor that we have. And here is our T antigen. So our viral T antigen is going to bind the RBTF complex. So when we get this viral T antigen RB transcription factor complex, when the T antigen binds, what it does is it actually kicks off the transcription factors. So the binding, so the binding of that T antigen causes release of the transcription factors. And now that the transcription factors are free, well, there's nothing that's stopping the transcription factors from binding to DNA and for transcription to occur. And now that transcription is going to be on, we can push through the cell cycle. Well, we introduced two pathways at, in day one. So if we introduce two pathways, there must mean that there has to be more control than just this RB pathway. And absolutely, the second pathway that we're going to talk about is P53. And we're going to talk about how does the T antigen that we have play a role in controlling the P53 pathway. So recall from day one, that when we have DNA damage, that is going to signal P53, and P53 can turn on apoptosis, and it's going to turn off cell division, right? And at first of first, it's going to try to fix the DNA damage, but if it's damaged beyond repair, we're going to turn off cell division and turn on apoptosis. So, not only do we have to turn on the cell cycle, so continue the cell cycle, so we go through cell division to be in the S phase for the DNA viruses to have their genome also replicated, but we also have to stop apoptosis, 
because if we can't stop apoptosis, the cell will realize something is wrong, it'll undergo apoptosis, and we will get no viral progeny. So these viruses also have to, weigh, have, to have a way to control or counter P53 because otherwise everything is in vain. So there's a couple different ways that we can do this. You can imagine that you could stop or block P53 or you can destroy P53, right? So those are the different ways that perhaps viruses using that T antigen can counteract P53. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a picture of the different ways that this can happen. Let's put P53 here in the middle and P53 of HERS is going to lead to apoptosis. And we're going to talk about the various ways that different T antigens work from different viruses. So the first example that we're going to talk about, so here's our P53. Let's make this bright green. Here is a large T antigen. And the large T antigen is from SV40. And what this large T antigen does is it's going to stop or block P53. So if the large T antigen is binding P53, then P53 can't bind the other proteins that it needs to to turn on apoptosis. So boom, problem solved. And when this happens, we have HERS block apoptosis. Now on the flip side, another example very similar to this is, let's draw another P53 on here, and that is adenovirus E1b. So we'll draw a smaller little T antigen. So recall that adenovirus has two T antigens. And much like the large T antigen of SV40, this works in a very similar fashion. This stops or it blocks P53. The only difference is that adenovirus has two different T antigens and E1B is involved in this one. And while SV40 also has two antigens, the large T antigen is involved in stopping or blocking P53 activity. So we've covered how the polyomaviruses or SV40 and how the adenoviruses do this. So they do this by doing number one, which is stopping or blocking P53. So let's talk about our third family of viruses in this second example. So destroying P53. So one of the things that can happen, let's go this way here on this slide, is we can have our P53 and we're going to have a T antigen that binds to that P53, and this can happen for papillomaviruses, so those that cause warts, and adenovirus. So recall that adenovirus has two T antigens, and so when this T antigen binds the P53, what it does is it actually signals to destroy it. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a garbage can here, and so that P53 that has been, that has been bound by the T antigen works very similar to almost a ubiquitin tag, which means that that protein will then be destroyed. And so if we destroy P53, this is great because now we have no P53, which means we have no apoptosis. So again, lots of different ways that these T antigens are going to play roles in affecting the cell cycle. And by affecting the cell cycle, we are of HERS inducing replicative immortality, which is one of the hallmarks of cancer. So let's go ahead and summarize everything that we have talked about between day one and day two, and we're gonna kind of put it all into one picture. And I think the thing that is the most amazing when it comes to this topic is that this all began with 
chickens. So the next time you are enjoying a tasty chicken, think about how it really revolutionized the field of virology and revolutionized everything that we know about cancer. So let's start by drawing our cell cycle again. All right, so we've got our cell cycle. We've drawn kind of a simplified version of this. And we can have a go, and this is going to be controlled by proto-oncogenes. We can also have a stop that is controlled by the tumor suppressor genes. And then let's summarize what was revealed by retroviruses and what was revealed by DNA viruses. All right, so by the retroviruses, what we learned was that these viruses integrate into host DNA, and we discovered a lot of oncogenes. For DNA viruses, what we discovered was that the T antigen is enough for transformation, and we discovered that they can turn on the cell cycle and they can stop apoptosis. All right, so I'm gonna stop here. This is a really nice summary of everything that we've talked about in this topic. And now that we have covered this topic, we're gonna continue with this fourth unit. And the next thing that we're gonna start talking about is antivirals. So another really cool topic for us to think about. And for antivirals, I'm going to kind of talk about more of the history, more of some of the big picture things, how antivirals work. And then my husband is actually going to do a short little segment and it's mostly going to be about the application of antivirals. So more from a clinical standpoint. So if you all have any specific questions or specific things you want him to talk about, let me know and I'll make sure that he does that. So thanks again for hanging out with me for another lecture and I will catch you really soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.